Hi there, um, dead quick intro. This was a presentation that I did on city branding. It's for my master's degree in design. I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, just let me know in the comments and I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks. Yes. Right. Does anyone want a break? Yeah, can I have a lie down? <laughs> Saw it now, isn't it? So we don't have to go through that again. Yeah, no. Um, so my presentation's on city branding. Uh, I'm just going to go straight into it first with you. So the, the rationale for it originally was I wanted to know if place, place brand was superfluous and could it serve citizens better if it wasn't. Um, so a bit more rationale. In my second year at university, during the first semester I was given place branding brief. Um, I'd seen designs for cities before as in place branding but I didn't really pay much attention to them. Arguably because it wasn't operating in my city to the same degree as you see in larger cities. Um, the brief was to pick a village along the Derwent Valley train line and develop a brand for the chosen place, and for me that was Belper. Uh, it was my favourite project for the BA, um, as although the outcomes were conceptual, the research stage was a tangible experience. We had to go there physically, talk to people, um, look at the locations, and it's something I hadn't encountered before in design. Um, and it also demanded more attention because the visual outcomes uh, and the potential viewers for place branding were far broader than any brief that had been done previously. So the brand's coherency had to be really strong for more people to understand it. Um, arguably this was the module strength, but I wanted to expand on the concept of branding a small village to a larger entity such as a city. Uh, when I first chose to engage in city branding for my master's project, I went into it with the same framework I deployed my entire time at university. I wanted it to be functional and I just wanted it to look good. Um, my professional background is in business to customer marketing and social media management. And as the foundation of which I started my professional career in design, it's safe to assume that my tendency to gravitate towards expediency, functionality and good aesthetics in design is anchored to that. Um, however, my conceptual framework changed during the first semester of the project when my nan passed away. I shifted from extroverted output to introverted expression. Uh, where you live is an innately personal experience. Your home is somewhere where you're completely comfortable. And if there's a deep underlying connection between people and places, then city branding is something that should be treated delicately and compassionately, not the aforementioned framework I was accustomed to. I wanted to explore the concept of a visual city brand that understood its connection to the people that lived in it. Doing so will require me to critically analyse the BA module, sorry Leo, uh, and practitioners within city branding, including myself. Uh, I also needed to research the philosophical concept of city, of brand and city brand to ascertain shortcomings, best practices and potential ethical challenges. So a very brief module analysis. So with regard to the research phase of the project, we were to collect assets from our selected place, so Belpa. We needed to identify a unique selling point and then construct a target audience. As is often the case with creative work, we begin by establishing a certain creative parameters and constraints, otherwise it's, it goes everywhere. Um, this might be problematic because by setting identical constraints to many students, it's likely that the creative process and its outcomes would become homogenous. From an educational viewpoint, it's fair to say that giving students a workflow allows for a structured approach, but the potential visual limitations of this learning framework can emerge quite quick. Several factors play a role in design. In terms of how to brand a place effectively, many agree it's important to involve the people it represents from the start, such as the community and various stakeholders. Doing this takes time, but how much time is too little or too much? Researchers of place branding have not treated this aspect in much detail, so it remains unclear what the amount should be. It is possible then that the similarities of the two logos we see here, so we've got Belpa, big bolt right in, we've taken this like, promenade feature and we've banded it here, and then we've got my version here which says Belpa in big clear right in, and we've taken a big structure and we've put it there. You can see how the visual represent representations are very similar quite quickly. Um, yeah, so it's, it's possible then that the similarities of the two logos seen here could be due to or affected by the constraints, uh, time, the lack of stakeholder engagement, etc., that were specified to us. In this case, landmarks seem to lead to the centre stage for representing a place. And interestingly, though, this isn't a technique seen only by an ascent designer, this is something you see in actually critically acclaimed professional designers. Um, it's not to say that institutional learning techniques are responsible for branding homogeneity, but several factors play a role in design and to ignore it could be problematic. Uh, my project and I just so where I am currently with, with my project. So quite early on in the, in the project I turned my head to using handwriting as a means to showcase the humanity of the city of Derby. Early iterations of the design evolved test methods to create hundreds of variations of hand-drawn D's that you see here. 
Uh, with that, I then proceeded to get real accounts of people's memories of Derby and get them to sign up for the capital D, which you see here. I then took the inset of that capital D, which you see here, uh, and created a logo that had the potential to have over 400,000 variations, which is more than the population of Derby itself. And this was to highlight the diversity of people to show that we're all different. My issue as a designer was that I was obsessed with making a coherent brand language to make all of it fit, that I ended up diluting everybody's unique input into a vague, ambiguous representation of it. When I looked at adding in the handwriting of memories into a digital space, as you can see here, it felt like something didn't fit, something was off. Uh, my latest point in the project came up with the idea of rendering these D shapes and placing them on buildings around the city with the memories on. What I later realised that by placing these renders onto the building, I changed the meaning of the building itself and it started to disrupt the memories that had been written on them in the first place. I started to slowly understand the magnitude of the task at hand and realised that I needed to, I needed to start asking actually how and start ask, asking the question why. So why am I doing this? Why do we even brand cities and why is it so hot? So, the first question is, what is a city? So a city is a relatively large, dense and permanent settlement of socially heterogeneous individuals. There's a lot to be said for the words relative and socially heterogeneous individuals in this definition. I just want to briefly focus on the word relative. So cities and their residents haven't always existed in the scale that we do today, and though estimates vary, Mesopotamia has a city state known as Europe, but in around 3100 BC, the city may have had 40,000 residents. If you compare that to today's, to today's mega city, described as a very large city, especially with one of more than 10 million people living in it, then we can see a stark difference numerically. But residents of Truro would make a good case that population size doesn't really make a city with an estimated population of 20,000. And the case can be made against relativity, because when you look at um, the city of London, which is inside Greater London, you have a city within a city. So it seems then that defining cities by their relative size is problematic. I understand Truro, around Truro, there's hardly anything, so that is the focal point of its surrounding area. But the city of London is inside Greater London, so that doesn't really make any sense. So the definition is problematic because there's a non adherence to the definition pretty quickly. Um, and if size can be eschewed from the definition, then we're left with socially heterogeneous individuals. It might be then that the city is best described not by its physical construct, but by its sociological one. If this is to be accepted, then several implications arise. <clears throat> it means that city behaviour is relative only to city living, sociological behaviour differed in pre-city living, and there's an underpinning mechanism for the causality. Emile de Klam's theory of modernisation seeks to address these points with a term he coined dynamic density. He suggested that societies transition from being primitive and mechanical to modern and organic, and the difference lies in the source of their solidarity or what holds them together. So think about um, actually, I'll explain in a second. So in, in that process of when everything goes from mechanical to organic, there's a process called the division of labour that takes place to accommodate the transition. But it's not just predicated on just the number of people in the society, even though it's important, but the, the density of interaction, that's the decisive factor. So how many times people are socially interacting with each other is what changes the society from being primitive to what we have today. So he claims. Early societies then adopt a mechanical solidarity. They're held together by their own self-reliance, experiences and core beliefs. Today that's best exemplified by the uncontacted tribes such as the Sentinelese. Sociologically, they're homogenous and their collective consciousness is synchronised and really strong as a result. So think about like a, a large one together, a tribe. If somebody came into that, they'd all be straight on it because it's a very compact thing. Even though if they were on their own, they'd all have the same things, the same daily things are extremely similar and that's why the collective consciousness is, is really strong. Now, as both the number of people and the number of social interactions increase, we see the division of labour introduced. People are no longer reliant on themselves, but of each other in order to, to survive. So think about it this way, there's now more people talking, people go, do you want to go hunting today? I'll do the farming. I'll do the farming, then can you do this and you do that? And so this is the division of labour. Out of that comes the specialisation of labour. Because without that, if somebody said, well, I want to be a farmer too, and I want to be a farmer, then there's too many farmers and there's not enough land. So what happens is we go, well, you can be a farmer, but we need to research this. We need to specialise in this area. We're not quite sure how to do this. And this is what happens over time. This is a long and fluid process. Without that, the competition for resources would have caused humans to die off. If everybody's fighting over the same, they have to do the same thing. So there has to be this social sort of interaction. Uh, and this results in the diverse, diversification of the society. 
it can be said that by the time a, a tribe becomes a town and a town becomes a city, organic solidarity is long established. Individuals become increasingly specialised, they aren't self-sustaining, and the collective consciousness is weakened. So what is a city? The identity of a city is a non-identity. This is because its only identity is diversity. By this point, we're all diverse, we all have our own thoughts and feelings, we've got our own specialisations, we're not part of the same collective conscious anymore. Arguably, the city is heterogeneity in scale. Unity is not the object of the city because the city is pluralism, as Aristotle said. So what's a brand? A brand is a name, term, sign, symbol, or design, <coughs> or a combination of them, intended to identify the goods and services of one seller or group of sellers and to differentiate them from those of the competition. That was Keller. As with cities, branding hasn't operated with the capacity and intensity as we see them today. Research on the subject of branding can be limiting due to its inherent tie-in to marketing. Even Keller's definition suggests this when he's mentioning the differentiation of competition. Very few articles, uh, articles studied in the marketing literature have strictly examined the inherent characteristics of brands themselves as their own entity, not tied in with marketing. Moore and Reed show an emergence of studying the concept and history of branding phenomenon in its own right, and Bastos and Levy seek to free branding from the shackles of marketing too. They write that researchers have neglected the branding phenomenon and the way it entered the discourse of marketing theory and research. If we're going to attempt to answer what a brand is, then the question of whether or not brand has maintained its definition throughout history becomes more pertinent to answer. So researchers often state that branding begins in the 1500s, but archaeological findings have shown hundreds of square seals dated back to approximately 2300 BC. It's been suggested that these seals were used for branding purposes and possibly with the intent of trade marketing. Uh, this is Moore and Reed. But Kenoya, Moore and Reed's source, claimed that they were administrative artefacts. Whilst the postulations of the two researchers differ, it's not to say that either have to be incorrect. But in fact, Kenoya's comments helped, helped the argument that brand's meaning wasn't related to marketing as such, but rather organisational. It was a bit administrative artifact. This could show that one of brand's earliest forms was utilitarian for the sender, knowing what was in the crate, that's the reason why the seals are on there, and, and its secondary form was transactional, the, re the receiver knew the origin from its mark. This is close to Keller's definition of brand, but it's safe to assume that there's no attempt was made to differentiate between others, as there was no evidence to, su to suggest there was any competition. There's no comp competition, you're not differentiating anything, you're literally doing it for the utility of storage. If we accept Kanoi's comments, then what becomes striking is the similarity in early brand and what was previously theorised by Erkheim in early society. There was a mechanical utilitarian nature to it. The way in which we interacted with brands seems to stay relatively stagnant across a long period of time with the evidence we have, although the standard marketing, uh, markings applied by guild workers in medieval Europe are another known manifestation of branding. By this time, goods traded uh, between the Arab world and Europe. So we're, we're seeing a lot more trade happening. Similar things are being made by different people. So um, where am I? Yeah, so more and Reed's earlier remarks about an ascent branding could hold more weight at this point in time. There were more people making similar goods. So before, it was so hard to make that argument if you're only going to send to one person from one person. Whereas now there's a whole mix of, of trade. This idea about branding and trademark could actually hold a bit more weight. Um, Donnie and Cannon suggest that the construct of trust involves a calcul calculative process based on the ability of an object. It could be said that these were some of the earliest signs of trust within brand and signaled a significant change from utilitarian to behavioural. So now that we're buying from many people, this mark now holds a bit of weight to us. And if we liked the spoon from Europe that had this particular mark on it, we might want to buy the same spoon from Europe with the same marking on it again. We trust it now. There's a behaviour that's become established and it's not just a pop-up, it's just a sign from where I bought it. There's a difference there. It could be said that, um, that this shift to the behavioural brand increases due to the number of brands that are operating in the space, which is quite interesting because this is very similar. Modern branding and the use of individual brand names has its origin in the 19th century. The Industrial Revolution allowed transportation routes to form and flourish, population sizes increased rapidly and brought along demand for new products in the progressive era. Hart and Murphy, Hart and Murphy stated that the greater the quantity and variety of products, the greater became the demand for them. And they note this is the reason for brand names to exist in the form that we know them as today. 
arguably post World War II saw the return of this explosion of consumer goods but at a much greater scale. The behavioural brand was struggling due to not only the number of brands that now existed around it, but because of the technological advances, TV, radio, print, the number of interactions people were having with brands had also increased. It could be said that as a result of this, the behavioural brand became the symbolic brand. Um, and Mina Good writes, at a, more, at a more emotional, symbolic level, a prime function of advertising is to achieve for a brand a particular personality or character in the perception of its market, and this is achieved by imbuing the brand with specific associations or values. So now we're buying based on how it makes us be perceived, very performative at this point. There's something that I've come up called Air Climb's Corollary. <coughs> there is a massive, massive uh, similarity between the mechanics of city going from primitive and mechanical to modern and organic, the source of the solidarity being um, changed by the number of interactions with people. And what you see with brands actually has gone from utilitarian and transactional to transformational and symbolic, and that's down to the number of interactions that we have with brands. There was a massive like similarity here. So, what is brand? Not our brand, but what is brand? That's a better question to ask. Today, Brand is a name, term, sign, symbol, or design, or a combination of them, intended to evoke emotional responses. Brand is a value system. Brand is an idea, a perception. Brand is religion. Nietzsche questioned traditional values when he said God is dead, but advocated new ways of thinking through values that matter. Both religious values and secular morality are told through human storytelling, something picked up on by Samuel Johnson in the late 18th century when he said, how small a quantity of real fiction there is in the world and that the same images with very little variation have served all the authors that have ever written. Brand aims to unify the thought of its viewers through the use of value systems to tap into the individual's perception that all humanity is my in-group. This is the collective conscious that was weakened. Now we're tapping back into that to buy stuff. If brand is unification of thought, then brand is homogeneity. With the advent of the internet and social media, brand is more omnipresent than God ever was. So, what's city branding? If city is heterogeneity and brand is homogeneity, then city brand quickly seems paradoxical. They're at loggerheads with each other. <clears throat> As we're aware by now, problems of definition and conceptualization have long beset the word brand. City branding holds the same issues as its parent term. For many researchers, city branding is entangled with marketing and globalized capitalism. Friedman writes that city branding and city marketing are integral economic development strategies for urban growth and for competitively repositioning the city in global urban hierarchies. That's very marketing talk, isn't it? City brand's conceptual issues may be down to its inherent paradoxical tensions. A city brand's construct doesn't have a point of singularity. No one person can define a city. It's a dynamic, fluid process that never ends. It's not static and neither is society. A company's brand, however, showcases its values chosen by somebody, and those values as an entity are the constructive brand you see. It can be made, it can be delivered, and it can be all the signs, all the signals, it can be sent directly to you. It can't happen with the city. So city branding's paradoxical nature doesn't end there. I want to now show two significant paradoxes that city branding possess, and the two archetypes that designers deploy in conjunction with them. <clears throat> Paradox one. City branding seeks to tell a unique story but as cities become more alike as they develop, so too do their brands. So what's the material difference between London and New York, apart from where it is? They, they're massive cities that look very, very similar. <clears throat> Maitland writes that cities attempt to outdo and distinguish themselves from their rivals may reduce their competitive advantage as they become more alike. How do we brand effectively when there's very little difference in how our cities look? What's the material difference between Derby City Centre, when the focal point is the massive shopping mall, uh, compared to, say, Sheffield's Meadow Hall? What's the material difference in what we, how we approach that city? More ambitious cities are using iconic buildings to be admired and to develop significance in the globalised world. Iconic buildings are tools to communicate the status symbols of the city and attract visitors. So, if cities spot a rival that seems to have found a successful formula with buildings or events and copy it, then we can argue that the design of city brands will follow a similar trajectory. So Baku of Porto is the example of the first one. Baku's logo takes shape through a variety of pictographic references to the city, 
taken from varying locations in the city, Baku's identity is shown as the sum of all of its parts. We can see here, we've got a sea that's been illustrated here, we've got a doorway arch that's been illustrated here, and they take this abstract sort of um, geometric approach to signifying all the different parts of the city. That then is collectively put into this logo of Baku to show that all of it becomes Baku. When we look at Porto, if we compare it with Porto, we can see immediate similarities taken from the Azula Hoss in the city's architecture. We can again see pictographic references made for the entire city, albeit in a reduced colour palette. There's very little visual difference in these two city brands as they're operating in the same architectural city branding archetype. So we can see here, this is the Azula Hoss here, most of you probably know it from the train station in Porto. And what they've done is they've taken this as a reference point and then they've made uh, pictograms of everywhere across the city that's seen here. And then their branding is all of it. Again, Porto is the sum of all of its parts. And they're using buildings and locations around the city to do that. It's worth noting that it, it does seem like a step forward in design maturity when we're compared to, say, other architectural city brands. Uh, we already know from reason that cities are using iconic buildings to be admired and to develop significance in the globalised world. San Francisco and Paris show that although their iconic structures predate city branding and arguably have more cultural capital due to the heritage of them, that the design deployed in conjunction with them falls flat. It's not as good as Porto and Baku. Why? Um, Porto and Baku's representation of the city, in my view, shows an awareness that depicting a city by a singular structure isn't a good way to represent its citizens arguably because there are connotations that there's only one real reason to go there, not the multitude of reasons that Baku and Porto aim to show. There may be even a point to make that the perceived design immaturity of reducing a city down to a singular building structure shows the sociological heterogeneity of a city doesn't like to be put in such a simple homogenous box. But with that being said, does Porto and Baku even represent the city at all? Does it represent the people that live there? Second paradox is that City branding aims to reflect society, but its very presence shapes society. When our experiences are mediated by technology and representations, they can become dis disconnected from reality. Jean Baudrillard sought to examine the relationships between reality, symbols, and society in his book, Simulacra and Simulation. Simulacrum is commonly described as a synonym for simulation, and a simulation is the imitation of the operation of the real world process or system over time. Simulacra, however, are considered bad imitations that attempt to create a better reality, and because of that, they fail to represent reality. Baudrillard theorised three stages of simulacra that are, again, shockingly in line with air time and the corollary. So number one is the counterfeit is the dominant schema in the classical period from the Renaissance to the Industrial Revolution. So the uniqueness of objects and situations allows them to be real and signification is towards this reality, like the Mesopotamian seals. We know that they're seals, they're just a thing that we can see, there's no, nothing else is at play there. Number two, production is the dominant schema in the industrial era. Distinctions between representation and reality break down due to the proliferation of mass reproducible copies of items, turning them into commodities, and then the commodity's ability to imitate reality threatens to replace the authority of the original version. Now that there are so many seals, they're all operating in different ways, the behaviour is now established, and that behavioural establishment at this sorry, the establishment, the establishing of that behavioural switch is now breaking down reality. Three is that simulation is the dominant scheme in the current code governed phase. We meant, you meant postmodernism, probably didn't have a name like that at this point. Simulacrum precedes the original, and the distinction between the reality and representation vanishes. This is the symbolic brand. We're going by feelings now before the actual object. City brands are simulacra. They're a visual representation of an idea of what the city is, and then this is fed back to its citizens, of which their attitudes and behaviour will change because of this to varying degrees. Architectural city brands do retain some semblance of reality by referencing buildings and structures, but another archetype, uh, archetype of city branding, which I've called abstract city branding, separates itself from reality further. Uh, so in the case of Melbourne, with abstract city branding, designers choose to showcase abstract concepts like attributes and emotions in their branding. Landor, the company behind the rebrand of Melbourne, wanted to reflect the different aspects of the city, from authoritative, restrained and serious, to vibrant, visionary and passionate. We know that the city is diverse, and that's what's being represented here through the various different M's. They also cite the importance of finding an accurate view of the city or country's deepest, truest distinctions. 
that's a really contentious statement given the previous one is a very oxymoronic. Uh, but cities are diverse, and if this represents it effectively, I think it does, uh, then there's something to be said about this type of design compared to the architectural city branding, which I think doesn't represent citizens more, it represents the actual buildings more. Madrid's take on abstract city branding is one of emotion. Eritrez, the company behind the design, says it embraces its traditions and values as well as its citizens and visitors, which is shown that nice little hug. Uh, a lovely sentiment of secularism, but it also becomes contradictory when they say that the city brand is something which should not be constructed as it already exists. It's again, really contentious because you're literally constructing this idea of the hug. It might have been in some people's minds tacitly, you can't assume that if we're all diverse and different, then you can't assume that a story for everybody already exists. Madrid attempts to become, the, uh, to become anthropomorphous by adding the two arms to physically embrace a visual construct of an idea based on a story. Designing abstract ideas such as emotion is, a t is tough because if, if they are diverse, then how can one emotion succinctly frame an entire society? And while this doesn't seem as coherent as Melbourne's strategy, it still does appear to be closer at representing citizens uh, rather than an architectural city brand. Does that make sense? My conclusion. Throughout this uh, seminar, we've looked at branding city through time, something that isn't addressed in city branding research. Societal changes are dynamic, fluid, and organic, and have and will continue to do so over time. It's this relationship with city and temporality that I want to take into the next phase of my city branding design. City branding place, uh, places the representation of itself in stasis when this can't be true with reality. I will seek to have Derby City Brand be acutely aware of its relationship with the citizens and of the time itself. Looking back on both the Belper project and the early stages of this project, I can see I fell into the simulacra trap of which postmodern designers consistently find themselves in. I hope to expand on this research to provide a coherent framework for city branding, which may include deciding not to brand the city at all. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks guys.